Okay, so pretty much a very impromptu live stream. Decided to, uh, I have to finish up this order for uh, some garters, so I figured I'd go ahead and just live stream it. If anybody shows up, great. Not, it's no big deal. This fits in with my theme of being on the edge between analog and digital. So let's uh, let's do a little knitting. Now, these are kilt hose garters. Um, you know, traditionally uh, they would have, um, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, when you fold things plied together, some uh, reeds or something like that, or grass or something to make a garter that you could use to hold your uh, kilt hose up. But they also knit uh, garters. So this is uh, where the garter stitch comes from. It's a very simple knit stitch. It's very stretchy. So you could take a fiber. Uh, you could do it with metal. I've seen that kind of a thing where it's knit together or acrylic or something. This is 100% wool. And um, this is where you get that stretchy garter kind of a thing. So these have been completed. Um, I sell uh, a couple of knitted items for uh, Scottish, um, you know, outfits. Um, you know, kilt hose garters is one of them. It's to help hold your kilt hose up. Uh, the other is Balmoral Bonnets. Uh, which I've got here an example of. So this is uh, knit from 100% wool, very large, and then you um, shrink it down. Uh, the technical term is felting, or not felting. Felting is a different thing where you take loose uh, fibers and jam them together to mix up the threads and then make a make a fabric out of it. It's called fulling, actually. So you, but it's commonly referred to as um, felting. What you do is you knit a garment, a hat, and then you use hot water and friction to make the uh, wool fibers knit together, and um, you form a, a fabric like this. So this hat, when it's knitted, is about you know five times larger. And this is what you end up with. Anyway. So, I'm going to excuse myself for a moment. I think there's someone at the door. So, I will be right back. My daughter got it, so we're all set. Anyway, so these are uh, 44 inches long, and there is a particular way that you wrap them around uh, above your calves, below the knee. Just a moment, please. The mailman needs to talk to Ugh. 
Sorry about that. I um, mailed, did an international mail package, just a, a little padded envelope to uh, to a fellow uh, YouTuber and, uh, sorry, I'm out of breath, <laughs> and um, person that uh, does retro stuff. I had some uh, laptop memory that would work for for uh, for them in their uh, computer and stuff. So I. I mailed it and I ordered or I scheduled it for pickup and said it's in the mailbox. Well, I must have put it in the mailbox early enough yesterday that it got picked up yesterday because the mail carrier is like, uh, your package is not in the box, which is good. I'm glad he checked, but so I'll have to look and see if it maybe it went out yesterday. And so anyway, back to knitting. So. So the idea behind garters is that you wrap them around above your calf and below your knee and you fold the uh, kilt hose over the top of them. And you may have seen uh, pictures of you know, guys in kilts or well, women too because even though it's a male garment you've got, hey Garth, how you guys doing? Even though it's a, it's a traditional male garment. You have uh, bagpipe band members and stuff, and there are women in there too, so they wear them. Anyway, you wrap it around a couple of times. You don't have to do it, cinch it really tight because the wool actually kind of grabs onto the wool of the kilt hose. And then you, you can knot it. There's a couple of traditional knots you can use. You can just do a simple, um, uh, like a granny knot, not even a full knot, just kind of uh, cross it over. And then what you do is you take the ends, and I should probably demonstrate this, I'll have to do it next time. You take the end and you fold it up underneath and then pull it out uh, from behind and have it hang down. So you'll see if you look at somebody who's wearing, you know, a kilt and kilt hose and garters, there's uh, tassels or um, fabric that's hanging down on the outside of their kilt hose and that's because that's the garter. Now modern garters are a piece of elastic with the fabric hanging off the edge of them. The fabric doesn't serve any purpose in the uh, modern uh, garters. They could just do an elastic band and be done with it. The reason why they're there is because they used to be tassels that hung down from the fold in the knot that was on there. All right. Anyway, so what am I doing? I'm putting the tassels on the end. And there's a way to do that. This is the remnant of it being knit. Uh, my wife actually knit these because I was rather busy and um, she needed something simple to do. She does a lot more complex knitting than I do. So she offered to do them. She did a slightly different end or edge. I usually do a simple uh, knit slip stitch, which gives you um, a clean edge, but it doesn't do this um, pattern edge like this. And it's a lot neater and kind of, you know, stylish. And now I'm probably going to have to do that extra step when I'm knitting these from now on because I really like it. That looks nice. Anyway, all right. So, hey, uh, Bricks and Flicks, my friend from uh, somebody I attend the Renaissance Festival with is here. So, hi, Theron. It's good to see you. If you guys are into Lego and or messing around with... Um, you know, building Lego sets or anything like that, and also like movies. Um, uh, Theron's Bricks and Flicks is a really good uh, stream that he started up where he builds a, um, a Lego set or designs one and builds one that follows the theme and then they discuss the movie. And he's done um, a couple on Star Wars. So, you know, if you like that kind of thing, check out his channel. All right, so let's, uh, now this is tied and secured and everything, but I generally bury some of this underneath the edge just to help anchor it. You don't need a lot of 
of yarn because this will kind of knit itself together but it's just something I do I mean, you guys can't see it because I'm off the camera anyway so I'm just gonna weave this around in here to bury it so you just use a um, a needle um, that's got a really big hole on it and it's a blunt needle I forget what they call these things darning no it's not a darning needle anyway uh, embroidery needle whatever okay so that's buried in there so I can trim this end off and get rid of that bit of yarn so so this has a finished edge on it but that would be kind of plain hanging out of uh, your kilt hose let's find the other end might as well anchor these down Ugh. I need to move closer to the table so you know they're kind of stretchy too so you don't want to uh, pull this very tight when you put it through it's really just kind of hanging out there and the fibers will knit together over time uh, as you manipulate the the garter um, one of the things you know the care of these is a little different if it were made from acrylic it wouldn't be a very good garter it wouldn't hold up very well I mean you could still do it and tie it you could wash it all you wanted to and acrylic yarn is plastic essentially so it's not going to change wool however if you took these and washed them and let's say threw them in a washing machine it would start to uh, full and you would end up with this, uh, fabric like the Balmoral bonnet and it would be a lot shorter and it wouldn't work very well so what you have to do is kind of soak these in cold water and gently squeeze them because you don't want a lot of mat, mat, uh, bleh, mechanical agitation because that'll work the fibers together too. If you look at um, wool fibers under a microscope, they have little uh, uh, hooks built into them where the you know the shaft has little slivers of of that uh, forms hooks and then uh, they kind of hook together with the other fibers and that's how you why wool can uh, be uh, fold together very easily so the way I recommend that you take care of these is you just put them in cold water if you need a little bit of soap you know they can get dusty and stuff from walking around um, you could add just a little bit of wool light or something like that to it and just kind of gently squeeze it rinse it with cold water again and then take it and wrap it up in a towel and roll the towel up so that it doesn't stretch it. You don't want to sit here and squeeze all the water out. So you roll it up in a towel and squeeze the towel a little bit and then just let them dry. So that way they don't, especially the tassels. The tassels are just yarn uh, strands hanging off the end. They'll fray and knit, to, you know, fold together and stuff if you don't, if you're not gentle with them. But the tassels look nice. So you want to keep them on there. Anybody have any questions about wool? Obviously it's an animal product. Um, and one of the things you need to know, I mean, because, you know, there's a lot of uh, exploitation of animals and animal rights things, but um, sheep have uh, evolved, been bred over the years, that um, they need to be sheared or they can uh, they can suffer quite a bit um, you know naturally they wouldn't have been quite you know they would have evolved to work in an environment where they're constantly brushing up against rocks and you know bushes and stuff like that and it would remove extra um, wool 
from the outside, but now they've been bred to the point where they produce a huge coat. And if they don't have that removed, it's, it's oops, lassoed the silver, lassoed the scissors. Um, anyway, they develop a coat that if you know, you may have seen pictures of you know uh, sheep that were lost and surviving on their own, and they have a severe amount of wool that uh, you know it ends up collecting urine and and burning their skin because you know they've got urine burns all just you know to a point where they can't survive they can't move around very well they can't eat so so for for what it's worth they need to be sheared All right, so these are ready to be, to have tassels added to them. Let's get this out of here. Oh. All right, <clears throat> so how do you add the tassels and manage the right length and everything? Uh, so you could try to cut the tassels to the exact length you need, but you know that's not very good. What you do is you use a piece of card like this. One, two, three, four, five. Sorry, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. At least twelve turns here to get enough of them. Then. Trying to do it without a lot of tension because you don't want wool is very stretchy. Then you cut it off. Like I said, you cut it off. Really? There we go. Now I've got at least 12 strands the same length. Makes it easy. I do four three sets of four for tassels so so there's four there's four and I went around one too many times it's okay this is a really nice yarn too um, it's uh, Cascade 220 um, I use it almost exclusively for, I'm going to move my camera over here. I keep looking at the, uh, the screen. Let me tilt that up a bit. All right. Hi. Oh, yeah, now my other camera's in the way. Yeah, there is no good place to put this. I'm still working on uh, camera arrangements and all that nonsense. Yeah, whatever. Looks like I have a camera growing out of my head. It's easier to look this way. All right, um, Cascade 220 is a very good, consistent wool that uh, folds well. Gives a very, uh, it, it's very, it behaves very consistently. You can get wool, uh, you know, from any source. There's there's plenty of places where you can uh, you can get wool made to custom, uh, you know, specifications for it. There's different weights for thicknesses of uh, strands of wool. There's different uh, ways that the fibers are twisted together. So that's that's a whole nother topic. Um, but Cascade 220, I, I can consistently make the same pattern and it always comes out the, the same way. So it's a very consistent, uh, good product. Um, not cheap wool uh, a lot of people are like oh wool should be pretty pretty inexpensive you know it's a very common product it's been around a long time uh, this was twice as big well maybe not twice as big it was, you know it's roughly about this size right so this is one skein of, of wool and it costs about uh, 23 dollars so it's not 
cheap. Um, you can get cheap wool, but um, the stuff that really works well is not cheap. All right, this is a crochet hook. I do not crochet. Um, that's not true. Uh, I have a pattern that is called the, uh, I think it's the Gunnister Man. It was a bog body that was found um, in Scotland. Um, probably somebody that got hit in the head, maybe, or uh, was left for dead, but he still had his purse on him, clothes and everything. One of the things they found was a, a knitted bag that was that's a purse. Um, I don't have it around with me. Anyway, the loops for the tie for the purse are, uh, crochet, are crocheted. So, um, so you have to use a crochet needle to do that bag, and I wanted to do that bag. So, so that's how much crocheting I've done. To me, it's uh, it's weird. I I don't quite understand it. Um, my daughter, oldest oldest daughter, crochets, but um, anyway, that's magic. Knitting, I understand. So. Um, there's, al there's also uh, nail binding, or nail binding. I'm not sure how it's pronounced because it's, uh, I think it's Scandinavian, um, which is a way of using a needle, uh, traditionally bone or wood or something like that, to do something that looks very much like knitting, but um, you're actually sewing the strands of yarn together and then you have to once you get to a point you have to felt more onto it and do it anyway that um, nail binding has been around for millennia um, there's an example they found in an Egyptian tomb that's uh, 6500 years old so it predates that um, it's been around a really long time so if you include knitting crochet and nail binding together it's you know it's a fiber art that's been around a really long time all right so what do I do I put three tassels on so there's one on each end and one in the middle I start with one end and stick the crochet hook through underneath the end binding right so so it's like this take my fibers in the middle get them on that hook and pull them through now I've got a loop of yarn on one side. Let me stick the, the needle through just to kind of help with this. And then pull the ends through. And I try to make sure that the, the corner is hanging out as much as I can. And then you want to tighten the knot. You know, pull on these to try to make sure they're fairly even. And there. You've made a tassel. Okay. And this knot's fairly tight and it will stay. Um, in fact, it's a little difficult to get apart. So and then you do the other end. Put your strands on the, like I said, put the strands on the hook. So you want a crochet hook that's big enough to grab all the strands and pull them through, but not any bigger because then it gets difficult to uh, you can really distort your uh, knitting. You don't want to do that. And there's probably easier ways to do this, but this is the way I do it. It seems to work for me. I don't even know if I saw a video on how to do this. I just figured it out. I probably watched a video. Anyway, there. Now there's two. The two make it easy to... Oh, you also want to make sure you're doing this from the same side on, on here because otherwise the knots look weird. Um, 
and you want to get the third one centered between the two pull it through sometimes it gets hooked on there so you have to do it again All right. if you pull it too far obviously you're going to lose them on the other side now that I've got two of them here it's really easy to accidentally get them mixed up together okay I'm not missing any Try to even it out. Pull them all tight. And there. It is entasseled. Now, all the ends are uneven because I'm not pulling them through perfectly, so they look pretty weird. Um, you just trim them off and I use the card as a guide. Oh, this is another, uh, this is a um, a, um, a place that uh, spins and dyes yarn that's up near Traverse City. Very excellent yarn. Um, um, Kat has uh, done some custom dyeing for me. Um, she's experimented with using um, uh, indigo and matter um, and some natural, um, um, you know, traditional dye uh, materials and things. So, very good place to get yarn from. You can you can get it in Ann Arbor. Now, I don't know if they they sell uh, outside the state. They probably do, but very good yarn. Of course, you can mail order it too. Um, all right, so that's it. Now you just repeat it and I like to try to make it symmetrical so if um, I pulled the knots did the knots through this way I make sure that I'm doing it the same way on the other one I'm kind of uh, OCD that way doesn't really make any difference I have to cut more so let's check see who's here so Theron from Bricks and Flicks is here, and Garth Beagle. Um, Theron, uh, just watched a video where a sheep had 800 pounds that had to be cleaned and sheared and couldn't walk anymore, poor thing. After shearing, it was wobbly, happy as hell. Yeah, um, I think I saw the same thing. And, you know, uh, if you, if you, look at videos of right after shearing something like that where they've been that long you can see where they've got skin burns and things from you know because they urinate and it can't really leave the wool it ends up being a, like a giant diaper um garth my wife does a lot of crochet your your wife does magic because crochet means makes no sense to me at all <laughs> So, I mean, knitting is kind of magical, too. You're ta taking a single, and it's, you know, it's kind of mathematically interesting, too, uh, from a topology kind of a standpoint, because you're taking a single uh, dimensional thread and um, pulling it through and hooking it on itself um, to create a two-dimensional structure, right? Or a three-dimensional structure, really, when you, when you think about it. And the topology of knitting, there's, there's software programs that will actually do, um, take your design and your instructions for knitting and reproduce the garment in 3D so that you can see what it's going to look like. Or um, there's knitting machines, like uh, there is stocking machines that's a round um, kind of a thing, and it's got all the hooks coming up and uh, you crank it and it actually in a circle creates a stocking um, there's uh, there's uh, knitting machines that do just the side to side knitting I tend to do knitting in the round which means I'm making hats so I'm doing circular things or tubes that are different shapes um, and uh, I've got a set of 
So you may have seen different kinds of knitting needles. There's basically three types. So these are knitting needles that have a cord in between them. So these are similar to double pointed needles. They have a plastic cord between them and you could have uh, metal needles. I happen to prefer bamboo. Um, and this allows you to knit in the round. So basically you start something out, so you cast on, and then you hook the end to the beginning and make a circle, and then you just knit in a spiral, essentially. And these, uh, the, the uh, thing you're knitting fall onto the cord in between the needles. So they have different lengths, depending on how big of a round thing you want to do. And these are what are known as double pointed needles because they have, sorry, get it in the camera, they have points on either end. And there's a particular purpose for this. Um, this is another way you can knit in the round. So you're making a hat or something. You put a certain number of the stitches on each needle and you cross them. I'm using different sizes here, you wouldn't do that. Anyway, you go in a in a triangle or you could do four needles and you end up having them overlapped like this so it's kind of a square and when you get to each end you just transfer between the different needles this is one way of knitting in the round and in fact when the size of this gets to a point where you can't really use the cord anymore you switch to doing these double pointed needles that way there's another set kind of set of needles and this is what most people would recognize as a knitting needle when you're knitting a square piece or something and you've got these long needles and they have knobs on the end to keep the yarn or what you're working on from falling off and you knit with those two needles that's not the kind of knitting I do so um, she makes little crochet creatures my my daughter eldest daughter does the same thing um, so much counting and remembering the count. I could never do this. Mine wanders too much. I use a form that tells you exactly what you need to do with each line with circles on it so I can check them off as I go to make sure I don't lose track. Because you're right, it can get... This is easy. Uh, it's eight stitches across. It, I mean, you could do it almost in your sleep. Um, so that, that's easy. You just do the same thing over and over again until you get the right length. Knit round things. Yeah, I'll have to, um, I'll demonstrate that. Maybe I'll make another bonnet. Um, one of the things I like to make is um, Renaissance Festival, and I've talked about this before. You carry around mugs and you're outdoors, so, you know, leaves fall down and into it, dust collects on it that kind of thing so you don't want to be drinking that stuff and believe me if you go to the Renaissance Festival you're drinking water all day if you're not drinking alcohol uh, most of us drink alcohol so you're, you've got a mug that's got something in it all day long and um, so you make mug toppers and it's almost like having a stein with a lid right but instead of a stein you got a wooden mug it might have a wooden lid or flap over it you could have a cloth one. Um, if you see the Renaissance Festival Queen, Elizabeth, um, she has a glass goblet that has a cloth topper on it and a hole for the straw to go through. Um, I use, uh, I make a tiny Balmoral bonnet and put that on top of the mug and tie the back end ties to the handle and then put pins on it and stuff. So it's kind of an interesting way of doing it. I'm here. Can you restart the stream? You will have to watch the whole stream later when it's when it's that's the beauty of YouTube, right? You can watch it later. Um, I'm gonna and I, what I'm gonna do for the rest of the stream probably is just look to see if I got questions and just work on knitting this together. It's not even knitting. I'm just putting tassels on something that I, I need to get done. Uh, Retro techie, be right back. Okay. Yeah, um, if I don't print it out, I'm going to forget. And trying to go back and figure out where you're at is really painful for me. I knit very tight. Um, in fact, if 
some of the things I would like to learn how to knit require you to be very, uh, it's almost like uh, doing lace work. I knit so tight that I doubt I could do it and keep a consistent gauge, which is how many uh, stitches per inch you've got. Um, water, mostly PD medicinal, yes. So I drink water with impurities when I'm at fair. And one of my favorite scotches is um, described as being seaweedy, uh, burnt seaweed, I think was actually what it was. So it's, it's, it's like taking a, a clump of peat from the soil and shoving it in your mouth and lighting it on fire. I don't know. It's an interesting taste. Yeah, you could, keep, you could make it to, to keep, uh, you know, uh, stuff out of your wine. Let me go grab mine so I can show you. Yeah. I will be right back. little dusty it's been two years since I've been to fair for obvious reasons but here is my Ren Faire mug this uh, is a mug that is turned on a lathe uh, by a gentleman that um, takes dead trees so he, it's called reincarnated wood uh, he takes dead trees and stuff turns it to make a mug and then coats it with uh, food grade polyurethane I think um, and then it's got like door, uh, door pull furniture handles on it is what he uses. Um, the leather on this is some work that was done by a friend of mine who is a musician from Fair who does uh, leather stuff and um, uh, he's done some steampunk things and stuff like that. Anyway, so he wrapped it and lacquered this so that it would, had a nice uh, grip on it. Because, um, you know, you need all the help you can get when you drink all day. Um, but it, it's a very good mug. But, you know, again, nothing to cover it up. So I made a miniature version of a full Balmoral bonnet. And this is more of the Victorian traditional design. So Victorian bonnets have ties in the back and a gross grain ribbon. This isn't gross grain, but or, or is it? Yeah, I think it is. Um, around the edge and tend to be very slouchy. Um, now, they used to be, and you'll see pictures of Scotsmen, they didn't wear it with an extreme slouch to one side. Um, it was done more as um, an even cap that was um, shaped the same on both sides, but they would tilt it forward so that you had a brim to shade your eyes. So the, when you see uh, you know, Outlander and things like that where they've got these giant bonnets on that are slouched all the way to the side. That's not a traditional bonnet really, but that's what everybody expects. So, And I like to wear mine that way. What did I do with the bonnet? So if I put it on, mine is very slouchy. Um, but if you were wearing it in a traditional shape, uh, almost like an Irish Tam, it would be more like this. And if you were trying to shade your eyes, you would pull it forward and have that lip hang over the front. But I, I'm kind of a modern traditionalist. I do this. Think uh, military berets. Just similar hat, but not the same. Um, another bonnet uh, that is made is, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but it's very much like a military folded uh, like the Air Force wears for a cap. Um, gosh, I can't remember the name. Anyway, so that that is also something that's knit and folded uh, traditionally. Um, 
So I'm going to read some more of the things here. Oh, cool. I could use that to keep. Yep. So this could work, especially if you have a giant mug for wine. I suppose you could make them smaller, but what's the point, right? Oh, yeah, I got some buttons on here. So I don't know if you guys can see that very well. So I've got a Ron's computer videos button on there now. Both of his, because he sent some small ones. And I have, yeah, I'm Provax. Um, I've got my little uh, classic Mac. This is um, the uh, clan uh, crust for one of the clans that I have heritage from. Um, it's French and it's a phrase that means by by land or by sea or by land so um, you know there there's a joke that usually goes around in the UK about uh, Scots being afraid of water and swimming well think about it most of Scotland is on a, is on the, the you know on the ocean and um, major islands you've got the Isle Sky and the inner and outer Hebrides they're very well First in uh, sea craft. Um, a lot of the the heritage for that outer Hebrides area is Viking. So Vikings inhabited that area and and you know married and and interbred with uh, the population. So the McDonald's, um, which is the clan that I'm part of, uh, it's a sept of the McDonald clan um, called McQueen. And there's multiple McQueens in Scotland, so there's there's different ones. But um, I've been able to trace back not the individual people, but the name specifically to the Isle of Skye for uh, my mother's side of the family going back. So it's not a, a paternal uh, relationship; it's maternal. Um, however, you know I've got that much of a percentage of it. Um, Genetically, I also have German, and, and there's some German on my father's side. Um, uh, both sides of the family, I lose track around 1795. Um, one side was in New York, New Amsterdam, and Vermont, and the other side was in North Carolina, and uh, moved around from there. Um, my father's side of the family, the Miller side, followed the Erie Canal, settled in Ohio, and then settled in Michigan. Um, they weren't uh, uh, pioneers in the sense that they were the first to settle. They were like second wave immigrants who uh, came to the Michigan Territory and bought uh, farmland that had already been cleared. Um, so I, to me, that's the smart way to do it. You buy the land after somebody's done all the hard work. Uh, this uh, thing here represents my knitting and I've got some other pins for knitting here um, and and this is something dear to my heart pineapple does not belong on pizza you can't convince me it does um, and this is a nice little uh, emblem this is from uh, some some ladies that um, do ceramic mugs and hand thrown and they create mythical creatures with them and they, they have some great stuff uh, misery um, so very excellent mugs you can buy them online too anyway so that's that's my uh, mug topper okay yeah I, it's pretty cool I you know I took the the full-size Belmarle bonnet pattern and then just kind of played around with it until I got the right size for the mug topper I, I even, I, there was a very drunk young lady who had a, um, a little puppet with her of, uh, oh, who's the creature from Harry Potter, the house elf, I can't remember the name, anyway, um, and she wanted a little tiny uh, bonnet made for him, and I'm like, oh gosh, how am I going to do that, I'm going to have to use like DK weight yarn and and tiny tiny little thing you know uh, fortunately she was just drunk talking <laughs> so she didn't actually complete an order 
militantly adverse to pizza pineapple combo you know and i used to make the argument that um pizza is fruit and fruit doesn't belong on pizza I, or rather pineapple is a fruit and fruit doesn't belong on pizza uh botanically tomatoes are fruit and tomato sauce goes on pizza so i can't use the fruit argument doby yeah doby she had a little doby doll and she wanted a bonnet for it um anyway so I might still try to make some small ones. You know, it'd be cool is to do um, a meta bonnet. So I could have my Balmoral bonnet mug topper and have a tiny bonnet on it as like a pin. I don't know. Anyway. So, um, tomatoes. Yeah, tomatoes belong on pizza. Tomato sauce. Uh, if you're going to have a margarita pizza... You're just taking those uh, what, San Marino tomatoes and crushing them with a little bit of olive oil on your crust. That's how you make a margarita pizza. Anyway, so I need more tassels. Uh, get the card. Let's see if I can count this time. So one, two, three four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, oh, 10, I'm trying to do this so you can see it, 11, 12, and not make it too tight. I'm going to go around again just because, what if I miscount it, right? I always miss a little bit of yarn. All right. So we got our strands. Count off four. Another four. And of course, two extra. You know, if I keep doing this, I'll have another set of Got three strands. Fortunately, I already got this arranged so that it's the right uh, the right way. Get them on the crochet hook. Pull them through, but not too far. You can also use your fingers like this without the crochet hook. Pull it pull it around. Grab the corner so that you're not burying the corner. And tighten it up. Voila. Get your hook through. Grab the yarn. See, now I messed it up because I slipped off. So I just pull it back out. Untangle these. All right. Make sure I'm on the right side. Put the hook through. Put a little bit more tension on it so that you don't slip it off. There we go. Get my fat fingers on there. That corner from getting buried. Pull on the individual strand so that it's tight. Two done. And of course I'm messing up the strand here. Get the rest of the locks out of the way. Pull it through. Try not to get it mixed up with the rest of it. See, I almost missed some. Try 
try to even out the length a little bit. I mean, I could sit here and count them, but I'm pretty sure I got them all. You can see how it, you know, there's still one of these is loose. Which one is it? You have to pull on each one until you find it. And I'm still not finding it. All right. See, I got this loose strand here. It's not that one. It's not that one. Push some yarn through now. Pretty sure I got it tight. Anyway. There we go. So this one's done except for trimming. And repeat. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. I pull this is a cake of yarn. So you take a loop of it. And I made a, um, uh, I don't know what you call it. Oh, it's a swift. I made a yarn swift that you can put the loop of yarn on and then use a cranked spool thing that will put it in a cake like this. So it's all nice and even. And then I pull the yarn from the center of the cake so that the ball doesn't just rotate around. It's a lot easier if you pull from the center. The downside to that is sometimes you end up with a bunch of yarn that's knotted itself together and you have to carefully unknot it or you end up with a mess. Um, and if anybody has ever knitted before, what's worse than untangling yarn? Um, maybe going to a data center and walking in on a cabling nightmare that that would be as bad one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve so so maybe that's a parallel trying to untangle yarn and untangle um, cabling we can feel each other's pain. So. Let's see. Four strands. This has got to be pretty boring by now. Everybody's seen me do this. Four, four, and four. Okay. Get this one out of the way. You notice how, you know, this yarn wants to grab onto it itself? You know, you can, you can almost, you can just press on it and pick it up. Though That's the hooks on this yarn just saying, Eef, grab. Alright. Poke your crochet needle in. Pick up the strands. Pull them through. Watching while I'm working on cleaning, servicing a Mac floppy drive. Yeah, I've done that um, twice now. Um, the uh, the drive in my uh, Performa 550 decided to uh, when it ejected the disc, it it was tilted part way and it didn't come out. So I ended up having to pull it out and clean it up. But I'm I'm sure it had never been serviced. So that was an adventure. Okay, so I'm on this side. Um, I did not use uh, lithium grease on it because I didn't see any evidence on that drive of there being any lithium grease. 
I used um, some light sewing machine oil and just very sparingly stuck that onto the uh, where it looked fancy. I'd got that messed up somehow. Um, very sparingly, just kind of put dab some on a on a Q-tip and and stroked it over the areas. I didn't want to get too much on there. Um, Seem to do it, do the trot, do the trick. I don't know if the lithium grease is better. Ah, it's the second time that I've. Maybe I should shut up and not talk while I'm trying to do this. So if you work the yarn too much doing this, you can really mess it up. So, okay. There we go. The later manual inject drives didn't need as much work. The old auto inject ones the jam up, the old grease. Okay, so if I pull the drive out of my uh, Plus or um, SEs, those are the ones that are going to need the need the grease cleaned out and new grease put in. I also have a couple of other um, external drives. Now I'm wondering if I should do preventative maintenance on them. Um, I noticed that the new drive has caps on it, a couple of them. I should probably recap it. So I can't imagine it's any better than any other set of caps. Um, let me see here. This is something else I like. I really like these caddies. I wish they had never gotten rid of these because, you know, you can protect your uh, CDs with them. Uh, excuse me a second. So I've got, I have a Mac Plus that was given to me by somebody for helping her with her printer. And this is the external drive that came with it. So this is an original, um, 800k external drive that came with that plus and I picked this up at an auction um, that I sometimes come across equipment for and I guess this is a um, the three and a half inch drive that'll work with both um, an Apple II as well as um, you know the other stuff you know it's a SCSI interface interface or I think it's a SCSI interface anyway no I guess it goes for the floppy adapter so anyway I haven't even tried this drive out it's been sitting on my shelf for a year I'll have to get around to trying that yeah that one will likely need servicing yeah I'm pretty sure <laughs> You know, um, uh, Bricks and Flicks, uh, Theron has, it, what is it, an Apple II that you purchased when you were a kid from like a paper route or something, money. So, you know, someday if he gets tired of keeping that, you know, maybe we can make a deal. <laughs> hang on to it, man. You want to you wanna hang on to your first computer. You know, don't give that up. But if you ever decide to, make sure you contact me. I still have my first computer. Unfortunately, I don't have my first calculator. Um, my father was a mechanical engineer without an engineering degree, but he was a mechanical engineer. Apple IIc with the color monitor. Nice. Yep, I got to pay attention to what I'm doing here. Um, my dad was a you know mechanical engineer you know he started out as a draftsman but he he uh, he designed uh, um, automotive you know mach machines to make automotive parts that used a lot of cams and things like that for uh, uh, applying force anyway um, where was I going with that he um, 
really loved um, computers. Um, he unfortunately died before he could get his own, but he was uh, he was doing uh, CAD, AutoCAD with 286s or whatever it was that was uh, all the rage then. And I was in college. He really uh, he really nerded out about that stuff. Was really curious about the computer science stuff I was doing, even though he couldn't really follow it. Um, but. Uh, I forgot why I was even talking about him. There was some reason why I was bringing him up. Eh, it doesn't really matter. Anyway. But he would have been really into um, working with the old equipment and stuff. Uh, yeah, if it still works now, um, should ask the Garth and the, the rest of the guys here do do we need to worry about recapping an Apple IIc? Um, is there a battery bomb in it waiting to explode? Any of that stuff? I'm not familiar with the Apple IIs. Uh, is there anything that uh, my friend should be doing to make sure that he doesn't uh, have a sad? You know, because it'd be a shame if something were to happen to it. You know, nobody wants that. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Sorry, that probably sounded really loud. Dropping the scissors. None. Caps should be good in them, and no battery unless it, he, it, it has a super rare clock card on it. Theron, do you have a clock card? It hasn't been turned on in three years. The floppy drives are pretty solid too. Generally might just need a head cleaning. Okay. Now, can you do you manually clean that with you know, like using alcohol swabs and very gently cleaning the heads on those, or do you have a floppy cleaner disc that you can put in those? Yeah, head cleaning would be the reading head, if that's what you're asking about, Theron. Um, there's there's uh, the head that sandwiches the drive. And when it spins in between those heads, it's kind of like, uh, you know, cassette tape or something like that. You've got those heads. Um, the power bricks on them might go bad eventually, but there's a lot of cheap replacements on eBay. Okay. All right. So you should be good. Uh, there's nothing to worry about. For, you know, the, the classic Macs with the built-in screen and stuff have batteries that are uh, right on the board. And those batteries are time bombs. And when they go off... Um, they leak corrosive fluids all over the or the logic board, cause a lot of problems. That's that's why I ask. ISO on heads or with cleaning discs, but don't bother unless you're having problems. Great. Oh, nope for the. So you have to set the time in it when you boot it, if you want the time. All right, cool. It sounds like you've got low maintenance machine there. You don't really have to deal with. Um, a lot of nonsense with it. That's good. The display might need some work. Just try test it. It should be okay. So it might drift off and require adjustment. Is that what you're thinking, Garth? Yes, you chose wisely when you bought that machine. Just imagine, if that had been a PC that you bought during that time, it would be in a landfill probably, right? Macs are held on to quite frequently by people. And with good reason, they're beautiful machines, right? Not generic. Uh... There's a Tinker Different forum if you run into trouble. That is right, I should mention Tinker Different. 
Uh, Tinker Different is a forum that has a lot of uh, Mac enthusiasts, and it's not just for Macintosh. There's there's PC stuff there. There's uh, you know you name it. Somebody's got a post about it there. And uh, oh, the display would have any general CT CRT issues really. So yeah, I doubt there's burn in on it. Um, you know, I'm sure it was a, a gaming computer, that kind of a thing, so it wouldn't have been sitting like in a kiosk or something where it had a lot of burned in graphics. Um, so Theron, yeah, just hang on to that. You know. But like I said, if you ever decide to get rid of it, you know who to talk to. It's something I, I need to, to get. I don't have any uh, Apple II equipment. So yes, Theron, you chose wisely. Okay, so do I have this in the right orientation? Yes, I should be going from this side. Sorry, I keep moving it out of the camera angle. Still working around with the cameras. I'm using my uh, cell phone here as, uh, you know, with a droid cam. Um, I'll probably spring to buy the, uh, the, um, the paid version so I can get HD because it's a shame to to let that resolution go. Um, and it seems to work. It's stable. I haven't had any problems with it. Um, still trying to find a good solution uh, then using uh, you know VNC so that I can share a, a classic desktop on my um, when I'm when I'm working on code and stuff like that. But you know, the VNC there's a really neat project to do VNC for 68K, um, but it's it's still kind of beta wear and it's not 100% stable. It freezes up. But um, I have the same problem with the the software that's available for OS 9. Um, you know, it works most of the time, but if I'm in the middle of something, it stops working sometimes. Um, and this uh, eMac doesn't have any kind of external uh, video. I don't have a scaler, you know, there's there's a bunch of things I need to do. Um, I could be using one of the laptops with its external display, um, but I got to go from VGA to, uh, and it works fine with a VGA monitor I've got, I need to go to VGA to HDMI. And um, because of the resolution of the VGA, let's see, I'm not even doing it right. Because of the resolution of the VGA, um, you can't just use a cheap $20 scaler. Most of them don't cover the uh, frequencies and resolution that come out of the, the PowerBook laptop. So, you know, I'll have to experiment around with that. What, what we really need to do, and maybe this is on Tinker Different, um, we need a shopping cart, not a shopping cart, a... Um, a hardware list of uh, things that are known to work <laughs> links to them so that you know like I use this scaler and it works just fine kind of thing um, I know Mac 84 has done a video on you know here's here's how I do my scaling arrangement and the kinds of scalers you can get but um, you know we need I need model numbers <laughs> uh, Garth, the Emac supports video out. Oh, where does it support video out? Firewire? Okay. You know, because it does have Firewire ports. Um, this is an era of the Mac that I'm not familiar with, honestly. So, well, that's good. Yeah, maybe there's hope for me yet. All right, so tassels are done. Except... They're very uneven, so if you look at, let me move this stuff out of the way. 
you know, they're, they're rather ragged. And uh, I'm OCD, excuse me, about this stuff. So I will use a card to help me figure out what length I should trim it to. Although I think the width of that card's a little short. I want, I want them longer. So I'm going to place the card. Yeah, that's good. I'll put the card there. All right, and then you just snip through it, but of course you can't do it lying on the table because it won't work. So you kind of have to do a sandwich and then move your fingers out of the way. give it a trim. Now they're nice and even. Flip it around and use that as a guide for the other side. Kind of like cutting hair. And as with everything, if you cut it a little long, that's okay because you can trim it up later. If you uh, cut it too short, you can't put the fabric or the yarn back on. So, there. All right. so that's good. This is the first one I started with, so we're going to use it as the guide for the other pair. And obviously this does not have to be perfect because with use they're going to get a little bit frayed anyway. Okay. But, you know, in general I like them to look as well as they can. You know, your haircut should look really nice when you walk out of the shop. And it should still look nice weeks later, but, you know, a haircut doesn't last forever. And there, they are finished. So these are my extra long. Uh, usually I make them 32 inches to 36, so about a yard long. But um, if you got exceptionally large calves, good for you. I don't. Um, but even I will use the long ones because you can wrap around several times. And if you've got older kilt hose that have started to stretch out, but you like them and you still want to wear them, this is one way of extending their life is to use a nice set of garters. There we go. I just need to ship them. Uh, Nope, it has a video outport. It depends on which model you have, which will dictate which adapter you need. Okay, uh, this is one of the early Emacs. I don't remember which model it is exactly, but I'll, I'll get online and look it up. Of course, there's a dongle for that, right? Because Apple did everything with dongles. Like the, uh, the network adapter for my um, PowerBooks is a cable that plugs into that high density or um, it's it's a goofy port um, brilliant watching how to make this Eric you know I'll do a video where I um, I start a pair um, nobody's gonna want to watch the entire process of making them because it takes forever you're making a really long knit but you know the middle is all the same thing so you saw the ending um, I could show how to bind on. Um, 
I get to learn from my wife how to do this nice little decorative edge. Um, and then uh, how to bind off, and then how to, uh, well, you know how to do the tassels. So that's it. A lot of time involved in, in making them. Um, even though it is a simple pattern, it's a lot of knitting. Yep, it'll be like a mini VGA to VGA or to composite. Okay. Yeah, I've got a... Um, uh, where is it? I've got the PowerBook video adapter that goes to VGA. So, it sounds like it's a similar... similar cable um, oh shout out here so one of the things I decided I was going to continue to do is when I get stickers from from others I'm going to uh, include them in my live streams and stuff so this is one bit fever dream sticker which is a very neat design I'm thinking that this little thing on the top is a cat or a Pokemon or something or just random dots but it looks like something to me and then the Ron approves sticker um, I, li I like to think of it as the Ron abides sticker and then we've got so this is from Ron's computer videos here's his uh, his, his sticker uh, Ron and I met um, listening to uh, hyper talking give a live presentation on how to create these icons um, you know to do the one bit uh, design and he he was working on Ron's icon at the time so um, I found out about Ron and then found him on Twitter and then found um, you know the rest of the crew that way so um, it's Ron's fault that I'm here so if you've got a grievance take it to Ron but Ron approves so I don't know what you're going to do. Uh, and then there's the Retro Repair Roundup, which is uh, first and third Sunday of the month. And that's um, several guys talking about Macs and retro stuff and apples and um, silly things sometimes. Um, anyway, uh, then we've got... this sticker for the blue scuzzy which is a if you've got a aging Mac that's got a drive that's failing and it's a scuzzy drive this is an excellent product for um, doing that in kit form or you can get the the you know fully made version and it's probably one of the cheapest options out there for doing that replacing those drives anyway I'm working on uh, my logo which is you know you can see up there um, Still kind of working it out. That that is a uh, Atkin or what is it? Um, what's his name? Not Atkins. Um, the dithering solution. Uh, Bill Atkinson. That's it. Atkinson's uh, dithering algorithm that I used to create that. So it's supposed to look dithered. It looks like uh, a grainy mess. So I'm not sure what I'm going to do there. Maybe I need to change the resolution so that it's doing a, a lower res scattering. But anyway, so I'm playing around with that. So when I do my sticker, it's likely going to be square in that round. And it'll probably be something like that. Um, I have somebody uh, who's uh, that I've commissioned to do intro music and stuff so I can get that set up for the, for the live streaming and everything. And then, uh, oh, see ya, Garth. Thanks for uh, coming out. Oh, I can start now. Um, so, Jay from the House of Moth, you missed it. You'll have to watch the live stream. I'm done. I've already finished what I was going to do. <laughs> so, um, hey, Alex. Alex's Retro Shack is here. Cool. Um, so what was I saying? Oh, anyway, so I'm working on um, getting some intro and stuff. And, you know, I've got the two cameras going now. So it's a really professional setup, right? Um, 
anyway, I'm le I'm learning from the best. I'm I'm doing everything you guys are doing. <laughs> well, Jay, I will do a future video where I actually show how to start one of these, how to do the middle, and you can watch all 86 hours of the middle if you want, and then um, you can you could watch this one on how to do the tassels, right? So that's this is really good. It's not ASMR. It's it's a tactile thing, but that they're, they're really nice. I really like them. Yarn is really nice to work with. Um, don't use acrylic. Eh. Who wants to knit in plastic, right? Use natural fibers. Um, what else? Uh, so I'll show you this, Jay. So you don't have to. Uh, you don't have to go look through the rest of the stream to find it, but uh, one of the things I showed off is my Renaissance Fair mug. So, so here's the the mug made by uh, Reincarnated Trees. It's really nice. Um, but you know, you're outside all day, so I knit a small version of my Balmoral bonnet as a yep, yeah, too close to the camera as a mug topper. And it's got, you know, Ron's uh, buttons on there and, and various other things. So, and here's my little knitting, knitting needles thing. So. Hey, RetroTech Chris, how you doing? I've been listening and working on repairing a laptop. Well, you're better than me because if I try to listen to a stream and also work on something, I'll mess it up. <laughs> I'm not very good at multitasking like that. So, um... So we talked a little bit about the history of knitting, uh, showed off some of the implements of torture I use, and oh, you got Renfair stuff too, yeah. Um, my wife and I have been going to, well, let's see, the first time we went to the Renaissance Festival was back in the 90s, and we go to the Michigan Renaissance Festival. Um, which isn't the first, obviously. I think the first was in California, is where it got started. And the idea is that you're celebrating uh, the year 16, up to the year 1600. And the guy who wanted the year 1600 in there, it's actually the reign of Queen Elizabeth the uh, first, right? He wanted to make sure he could wear kilts, which, you know, there's some evidence that there were kilts, you know, back then. Um, Nice variety of content. Yeah, I you know I'm trying to make sure, you know my whole theme is analog and digital, so I'm trying to include both. Um, I'm always a pirate, looking drunk. She's the belly dancer. Yeah, the nice thing about the Renaissance Fair over say an SCA kind of a thing, the SCA, the um, Society of Creative Acronisms, it's all about authenticity. They're trying to do something very authentic for the period that they represent. And uh, and there's some of that at the Renaissance Festival too. But the Renaissance Festival, you see Star Trek away teams going, hmm, a primitive culture, you know. Uh, you see, uh, you know, people dressed up as fairies. You see furries. You see uh, centaurs. So there's guys sweating like, crazy and they've got a horse attached to the back end of them so they're a centaur i mean y y all kinds um i do a scottish uh impression that is um outside the period it's more of a 1745 jacobite revolution kind of impression but you know at the renaissance festival anything goes so you know you can get away with that um and I've, I've done a little bit of tailoring myself, self-taught. I've got a, um, a um, uh, what do you call it? Not a long coat. I have a, um, a coat that I wear that is cut shorter than the traditional uh, flock, frock coat, okay? Um, so that you could wear it with a kilt because there's some evidence that they did that. Um, that's made out of wool. So when I go to fair in Michigan at the time of year it is in August and uh, September, there's only a couple of days that's, that are cold enough that I could actually wear my full kit. Um, normally I'm going in a, a full um, uh, 
uh, kilt with the upper and lower portion. I mean the whole thing where you can put it over your head like a raincoat. You can sleep in it like a sleeping bag. You know the the full um, great kilt kind of a thing. But if it's hot out, I take the the my vest off and my doublet and um, just wear a linen shirt and have the uh, the kilt hanging as a tail. And that, which is correct too. Um, if you look at Outlander, the first season, there's a scene of Jamie out in a field cutting hay. That that's kind of the look. Um, the axe throwing is pretty cool. I've never tried that. Yeah, hanging out with friends. Um, my wife and I have been going for years. Um, there was, you know, we went in '95 originally as you know just just to go and see what it was like. And then went back after a good friend of ours convinced us to uh, start doing it. And she was doing steampunk. And we kind of briefly got into that. But uh, the mid-Michigan steampunk scenes kind of weakened. Um, anyway, so um, we full in on the Renaissance Festival. We, we spend most of our day um, sitting in the Guinness Pub listening to the bands there and uh drinking a lot so get up and go around a little bit but you know my wife's got severe back issues so we don't walk around the fair as much as we used to um and, and unfortunately um, some of the bands that um, we've come to love are no longer there so um we may actually have to find a new place to uh to uh to sit or maybe we'll we'll divide our time between a couple of venues but yeah renaissance fair is a lot of fun um where else can you see mermaids and queen elizabeth right yeah the bands are fun i really enjoy the bands um i'm a, a wannabe musician but unfortunately my hands uh I've got arthritis now, and trying to learn to play guitar is way too much effort. Um, and I'll never be any good at it, and that's one of the things that stops me from doing things, is if, if I don't think I can get to be an expert at it, and then I lose interest. So, um, I made a guitar, um, because I, I like doing that kind of stuff, and I learned a lot about guitars by building an electric guitar. and. Uh, and I can't play it, so it's going to hang on the wall. <laughs> if there are any of those in your state, uh, if you go online and do a search for Michigan Rena or Renaissance Festivals, you'll find something. Um, what's I, I don't know that there's a big one in Texas, so play a synthesizer. Well, there's also the whole um, musical skill thing that i got to do. And... Um, I'm very much a tactile learner. Um, I think that if I weren't a computer programmer, I would have been a shoemaker. You know, if, if there was some technology that um, I wanted to learn how to do, it probably would have been, I would have been a cobbler. Or either that or a press operator, like printing press. But, you know, I like having my fingers, and printing presses are uh, notorious for taking them off. Um, um, I did uh, uh, some graphic uh, arts stuff in junior high and that's where I learned photography and um, that's something else I still do is uh, analog photography you know film yeah you don't well I could play punk all you need is three chords right sometimes you can get away with two um, I got to I was going to pull something out here to show. I can't remember what it was. Uh, we were talking about music. No, I've already shown off the guitar before. Oh, I know what it is. Um, something I picked up at auction. And this is, this is only going to be an interest to photographers. However, it also has to do with technology. So... This is um, lithographic uh, glass plates, and they're huge. 
I didn't know if they were exposed or not when I was at auction, but generally the auction places aren't very careful about that. They would have opened the box and shown it off. You probably have seen that. Somebody is auctioning off uh, old stock film or uh, glass plates or something, and they open the box and show it. And it's like, well, you just ruined the plate, <laughs> you know. But anyway, I found these in an online auction. Uh, it's a place that my wife and I frequent. So uh, I picked up one of the laptops there that I have and uh, that, that uh, drive that I showed earlier. But this is a glass plate. I'm doing it the right direction. Nope. Okay, this is a glass plate, and there's several of them in this box that was exposed. And I don't know if you can see it, but there are traces on there, which look suspiciously like electric circuit traces. And the, the information on this says that it is board number 37100173, layer diagonal upright. So I think, uh, and somebody helped confirm this, that this is inner layer circuit board uh, lithographics that were used to, uh, to expose the, the photoresist uh, material they use for doing traces on boards. So, and I live in Michigan, southeastern Michigan, so this most likely was used for automotive. And somebody happened to have it, and uh, it ended up in the auction, probably from an estate sale. Um, no idea, you know, what it is, but several of the, you know, this one's on a diagonal. Uh, it doesn't include any of the, the top of the board or the bottom. You know, this is another one that's on a, another diagonal. And this one says layer vertical one. So this one's vertical instead of diagonal. And this one is layer horizontal too. So it, it goes sideways. So I suspect that these are different, or rather the person that helped me figure it out thinks they're probably the different um, uh, layers of a multi-layer board layout. So that was kind of neat. I spent two dollars to get it, you know, or three really if you add the tax and the um, the fee that they charge for the auction house. But yeah, it's kind of interesting. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. Um, I might remove the emulsion so that I can reuse them to do glass plate photography. Um, I'm going. I want to experiment with large format. I'm already doing large format photography, which is like four by five negatives. Um, this would be extreme or ultra large format, but uh, one of the things I want to do is um, cyanotype on glass. Uh, if you guys are familiar, one of the early uh, techniques of doing um, uh, photography was actually blueprint. Um, Herschel, who was the English scientist that was involved in trying to figure out how to do photography, um, he was looking for a positive process that he could use to uh, accurately reproduce a scene. And he was kind of stuck on that. He had, he had figured out how to do, uh, there's also Daguerreau, um, who was French. Uh, Daguerreau type was a way of doing a polished metal surface with a silver halide layer and you use mercury fumes and some really dangerous stuff for uh, for creating photographs and those are the ones that are it's a negative image that is on gla uh, metal or or glass and you have to put it in a box otherwise it'll get destroyed if you touch it um, and by doing a, ba a black background like a black felt or something on it you get a positive image when you see it because the silver layer that normally represents is dark because of the light reflects the light anyway so if you've ever taken a, a, a black and white negative and held it up to the light and tilt it, sometimes you can see a positive image in the reflection. Same principle. Uh, so Herschel was trying to figure out ways of doing this. And somebody had noticed that um, you could do photograms using 
um, uh, Prussian blue and some chemistry and it's light sensitive and that's how you get blueprints but it's a very slow process so you can't do uh, photograph anything uh, it you know if you did it in a camera with a lens and tried to do a cyanotype it would the reciprocity that happens with I'm sorry I'm getting technical anyway you have to expose it for a year <laughs> to like in a pinhole camera or something to get an image and as the image builds up it fades so over time you, you know there's no point in exposing it any longer you're never going to get any headway um, but you can take cyanotype make your own negatives with a laser or an uh, inkjet printer you can make your own negative and then lay that on top of um, paper that's sensitized with uh, the cyano uh, type solution expose it for five minutes to half an hour as a contact print out in the sun or use UV to do it and then you can um, you develop it by rinsing it in water uh, you can make it more intense by oxidizing the, uh, the, the chemicals using hydrogen peroxide. Um, you can use an acid bath to help control the contrast and stuff. You can make photographs with it. Um, and I've done that for a couple of things. So, long story short, I want to clean the emulsion off this glass, make a cyanotype gelatin solution, coat the glass like you would have with uh, albumin or you know uh, other alternative photographic methods and make a glass print with it that you then would frame and hang up and it would be a transparent kind of image that's in uh, a cyanotype so it would be blue. Anyway I thought that would be cool to do. Um, if you look online there's a guy that, uh, that does uh, and he's into steampunk he does those kinds of things and has, has developed an emulsion that you can do and stuff like that. So, anyway, that's the analog side of Eric's Edge. I'm really into that kind of stuff. Um, recently got back into doing film photography and um, I think I've shown these before, but one of the, one of the cameras that I restored is a uh, uh, Burke and James press camera. So if you think 1950s, now let me switch cameras here. It'd be easier to do this. Yeah, there we go. So this is a not focusing camera. This is a 1950s, uh, actually it's from the late 40s, press camera uh, called a Burke and James 4x5 press camera and you may have seen this style of camera um, uh, a, gr a Graflex is a, another common one but it's got a big lens right and this the ASMR on this is great I'll explain why it's got a bellows right and there's a reason why cameras have bellows like this. It's not just for old tiny cameras. Um, and then the back is a glass um, plane that the lens projects onto. The, the other cool thing here is that there are movements that you can make with a camera like this to adjust things. So uh, Ansel Adams has a book series on this that describes it. But you can loosen up this and if I get it loose enough, I have to unlock it. Excuse me while I do this. So say you're photographing a building and if you've ever stood below a building and take a picture the top of the building looks like it's all the angles are going away from you because of the perspective. Well, you can tilt the lens to get an angle and compensate for that. There's there's other movements for the camera too. Um, a full blown uh, large format camera gives you a lot more movements, where you can you can tilt the the lens 
up and down on, on a full, a regular uh, full uh, large format camera, you can tilt the film plane too. So you could actually have your lens at one angle and then you're filming at another angle and you could compensate for stuff. If you're taking a picture of a scene and you want to make the camera look like it's higher up, you can, you can use the movement to do that. Um, and you can adjust for the distortion like I was talking. This uh, camera ha takes film backs that are 4x5 and what it is is you've got two sh sheets of film, so it's not a roll of film, it's two sheets that are in a cartridge and it slides how do I show this? It slides in this gap in front of the glass so that it puts it in the same position that the glass is where you focus your image. You put that sheet in there and then you pull the slide out to expose it, take the picture. The shutter in these is in the lens instead of being back in here. Um, some of the cameras had a plain shutter that was back in here. This one, the lens itself has a shutter built into it. And if you look at some of the older cameras, that's how they did that. The shutter was part of the lens assembly. Uh, and I have one of those too. So this was a common camera that many people used. It's from 1912. Same principle. Okay, so the shutter and everything is right here, built into the lens. You've got a little viewer that you can use to, you know, frame your shot and everything. This one actually has different speeds on it and different aperture settings. So you can say how much light comes in and how long does it expose. It's a roll film camera and it's designed for film that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, oops. But you can see the same kind of thing. You've got this hinged body that closes up. So if I open up this camera, how do you open this camera? There it is. This plane comes off the back. Right? Now I've modified it. This took a size of film that isn't made anymore, but you can get 120 millimeter film or 120 film that has this size, you know, this um, width of film and then I cast these little adapters so that they'll go on the uh, spool for the film and it'll fit tight in the middle otherwise it would be loose all over the place, right? So the, the six 20 film I think it was that was in here isn't available. They stopped making it in the 80s. People are still using these cameras up until the 80s. Um, so this spool will work and then these adapters go for the pickup spool. This wood here gives you a track to f for the film to follow so that it'll fit in there and creates a frame on it so that you do have a little bit of a frame on the negative, right? So the uh, the downside to this is that the old films, and I, I don't know if you've ever seen a camera like this, they had a little window in the back of the film and on the backing paper on the film is numbers so that you could turn it until it got to the right, uh, the first frame you'd turn it and it'd go to the second frame so a number would show up here. Well the films that they had back then weren't very sensitive to um, they were blue sensitive so ultraviolet and blue light sensitive films and they weren't very sensitive to red light so when you took pictures of people the, the red like clouds or things like that you had to use filters and things to emphasize the clouds so they would show up otherwise you would just white out. Well, on, now we have what are known as uh, panchromatic films that span the spectrum from you know red all the way to blue and are mostly equally sensitive to it so this window actually doesn't work anymore. 
you expose the film it leaks through and it actually so some of the the first roll that I did with this I thought I had enough this was opaque enough so I could see the numbers and figure out how to where to roll the film I ended up with light uh, exposure along the edges so what I'm gonna have to do to use this and I haven't done it since is get it back together first and of course I've got it backwards nope I didn't want to do that yeah of course I've got it stuck now this is what I get for not paying attention to what I'm doing anyway I'll fix it later so what I'm going to have to do is count turns of the take-up reel and figure out by spooling uh, uh, just the backing paper to figure out um, how many, uh, yeah, they're sitting on the desk. I won't forget the adapters. To figure out how many turns for each frame and, and do it that way without opening this window. At least I had the foresight to put a shutter on here that would close that window so it's not open all the time. There we go. I got it off. So put the adapters back in so I don't forget and lose them uh, and I really could have 3d printed these um, there's designs online I don't have a 3d printer so what I did was I used um, uh, caulk and um, cornstarch to make mold material that I took um, a cardboard and wooden one that I had constructed together made a mold out of it and then cast them using um, casting material um, I tried using an epoxy casting material first time and it, it didn't cure very hard so I had to buy some uh, uh, more of a like a rotocast uh, material so it was a rather tedious uh, solution, but it, it actually did work. And here I'm trying to put this thing on upside down, upside down again. Give me a minute to do this the right way. So when I found this camera, it was covered in uh, a leather material that it dried out and was falling apart. So I stripped all that material off. There we go. I got it closed. I stripped all that material off and covered it in duck cloth and then glued the duck cloth on. That was tedious, but you know, it looks pretty good compared to the way it looked. I mean, the bottom's not great. It's kind of goofy, but um, anyway, it's a usable camera. It's just, you can only get uh, six photographs on a roll of, uh, 120 film because it's so wide um, the film for this is about a dollar a sheet for the film so each exposure at a minimum is going to cost you a dollar and then um, yeah no nope, I got that I goofed that up I gotta reel this back in um, each each sheet of film just for the negative is a dollar and then you're going to spend money on printing paper, developer materials to print it. Um, you know, I don't have an enlarger that's big enough to handle 4x5, which is fine because that would be overkill anyway. Um, anyway, long and short of it, um, I haven't calculated it all out yet. You don't just make one print when you print something you have to do you know contact prints and things like that to try it out it's probably gonna cost me about ten dollars for each print when I if I make a print so it's not a cheap hobby and I don't do portraiture or anything like that I don't want to do it as a business I really want to just do landscape photography um, if you look at uh, uh, Edward Weston and Ansel Adams and the um, F64 crowd. Um, I really like the type of art they did. 
Um, and that's the kind of photography I want to do. Yeah, there, there are modifications um, to do a Polaroid back. Polaroid's just as expensive. Um, it's not cheap. Um, I also have one of my my father-in-law's family was heavily into photography from an amateur standpoint and they were early adopters of Polaroid uh, cameras so I've got this Oops. this is a Polaroid um, 800 which was made in 1957 and um, you can't get the roll it's Polaroid roll film that it used but this is a really beautiful camera and design for a camera and again it's that similar thing it's got a bellows right and it's adjustable and everything for the focus so that was uh, a common architecture back at the back in the day oh great how do I close this and, so, and it came with some accessories this is an electronic um, um, electronic shutter that you can attach to the front of it so you could do a remote kind of a thing whoa this is a wink light it's not a uh, flash it actually just did enough light to um, to help because you could have uh, 300 or 3000 speed Polaroid black and white film for these things and it's got the manuals this is a light meter that came with it that uses a um, uh, selenium uh, cell, so there's no batteries to operate it. It still works. Oh. Anyway, this camera, now i got to figure out how to unlock it and put it back. And I don't remember how you do. Oh, there it goes. All right. Polaroid cameras worked on roll film originally. Um, you guys might be familiar with like a, an SX70 Polaroid camera where it just goes motorized thing and it shoots out a sheet of uh, a picture. Well, originally these things were roll film. So they had this complicated mechanism for this was a switch that cut you know the roll where where you pulled off an exposure and then uh, how do I get in here and they had this complicated roller mechanism where you would load I'm not even through all the layers. Now you're in the inside of it. You would put the roll film in this section. It would go across here. The backing was collected here. Then it wrapped up and went around, around this way. And here is where you would peel, sorry, here is where you would peel it off. heavy um, and then you had the two halves and you would peel them apart um, but you had to the rollers would um, spread the chemical out in the package but then when you peeled it apart there would be chemicals still left on there and they gave you a little brush that you used to clean off the uh, the remaining chemicals so it was a rather complicated process but you could get uh, a picture in minutes and um, they were very popular for that reason and how do you close this anyway these can be retrofitted for 120 film too people have dremeled out and drilled out things and and done stuff to to put a photo back on it um, but what there is one guy that figured out sorry I'm making all this noise I'm trying to lock things down there was one guy who figured out how to get a roll of film in there and wrap it around there. Now I got it locked. And wrap it around so that you could um, 
it would collect the film and the backing paper would come out where you normally pulled it out and then you would take it and put it in a camera bag that's dark pull the film out and roll it up and st but it ends up getting scratched and stuff so it's not worth the trouble so this is just a conversation piece you can buy these uh, in antique places for five bucks you know because nobody can take pictures with them if someone's trying to sell you one for fifty dollars they're ripping you off but anyway I keep it mostly for nostalgic reasons I was thinking about modifying it so I could do 120 but after I really looked at it it's like it's not worth the trouble and the quality is just not there and there are other rangefinder cameras that you can get that that do work anyway so I've accumulated a few cameras a um, couple of them I still use like the one that I showed you the the graphics camera I've only taken a few things with it I've got some negatives that I exposed um, last year that I haven't processed yet because that pile behind me is the dark room and you I have to get it all set up and everything and then develop in a tray in absolute darkness and then it's kind of an involved process but eventually I'll get there anyway so this stream went a lot longer than I planned um, and I think I'm gonna wrap it up so I want to thank everybody that hung out and uh, took a look at the knitting I was doing and you know I'll do uh, I'll do a future thing where I, I start off some knitting and then uh, you know if I'm watching a stream I'll probably be knitting occasionally I can't seem to work on the hypercard uh, course and also watch a stream at the same time it doesn't work um, I did promise myself that I would get the, out the next episode of that hypercard uh, course this weekend um, but I promised myself that several weekends and still haven't managed to do it um, but I am committed to doing it so um, there's that two hours isn't bad yeah um, some of the people here have gone nine hours or more uh, with streams so I don't have that much energy <laughs> In fact, I'm getting thirsty. So there's a Guinness in the fridge waiting for me. But in Theron, I need to catch up on your stream. Um, I I was camping last weekend, so I didn't see the one you did on Sunday. And uh, I'm really enjoying the stuff you're doing. So I'm looking forward to more of that. What else? I think I'm going to. Um, oh. Joe from uh, um, Joe's uh, Computer Museum. Museum Joe's. I'm starting to lose my mind. Anyway, uh, Joe uh, has asked me if I couldn't help him come up with a hypercard kiosk kind of thing um, that would uh, he could use as a you know a, a, a looping demonstration thing that would just run. And I'm like yeah I can do that so I'm gonna live stream that um, and I'm gonna do it completely blind so that well no, I'm, I'm not gonna be blindfolded but you know what I mean I'm not gonna prepare anything I'm just going to go into the stream and say well I want to do something that does something like that kiosk thing is there a stack out there that already does it here's where I would look for those stacks um, is there something I can reuse that's already in hypercard let's try that well and then work through how do I strip it down um, I already have something that I use for the course that's kind of like a PowerPoint presentation but it's a very crude one it doesn't do very much you know I could imagine something that that Joe wants that might have animation in it or it might have music um, you know maybe I could add color to it there, there's a bunch of things that well no color doesn't make any sense it's going on a uh, se30 anyway um, there's a bunch of stuff I could do but I could start with just the simple thing is there already a stack out there that does this can we modify it to do what we want and instead of going out and doing all the research 
and then doing a stream, I'm going to do it live and just say, this is how I search for stuff. And uh, all, all the warts involved. Kind of like the battery rebuild. Uh, hopefully this will go better than the battery rebuild. Uh, because that was kind of awkward. Um, I haven't figured out what's wrong with that yet. Um, probably not going to worry about it because I use them plugged in most of the time anyway. Uh, and 20 minutes is long enough to go into a coffee shop and make the hipsters wonder what the heck I'm doing if I use a, a, a laptop from 1995. Right? Anyway. Alright. That's... Oops. Jerking the camera around. That's it for today. Um, I hope uh, whoever else is streaming this weekend has lots of viewers. And uh, see you on the next one. Bye, everybody.